Good evening and welcome to Sex is Medicine, your number one resource for holistic sex education. I am your hostess with the mostess, Miss Davy Ward, here to lead you on an adventure for this next hour, uh, discussing and exploring ever more ways that we can increase and enrich our sexual satisfaction and come to understand sex for the true purpose, the true, the true tool that it is, which is a tool for growth, transformation, expansion, and healing through pleasure. One of my favorite sayings that really brings home the concept of the inherent sacredness of human sexuality, something that I learned when I first started studying Tibetan Tantra. And in Tibetan Tantra, this is actually, this is actually what turned me on to Tantra. I wasn't convinced until I heard this. But the Tibetans understand that every orgasm is literally a glimpse of enlightenment. And you will have heard me say this if you've listened to previous shows and in all of my interviews. I, I always make this point because I think this is so um, such a potent understanding for us to have in regards to reframing our ideas and our approach and our relationship with our with human sexuality. So at the moment of orgasm, as we experience this just ultimate bliss, right? It's like, like it's, it's the thing that we're all craving and we're all hungering for and we're all searching for is that moment of orgasm, that peak of pleasure. And so at that moment of orgasm, the moving pranas or wind energies in your genitals brush what we call your central channel, which is the energetic core of the life force in your body. So um, in Eastern science, the energy body is understood to be senior to the physical body, meaning uh, the energy body is literally what's holding our physical body together. And all illness and wellness manifests physically before it does energetically. And so, you know, Western holistic naturopathy and all that sort of things, holistic healing practices are, are starting to uh, incorporate that understanding more and more um, into the mainstream. So circling back to every moment being a, every orgasm being a, a glimpse of enlightenment at that moment of orgasm the moving pranas in the genitals brush the central channel and we get a glimpse of enlightenment so if you think of that moment of orgasm that pristine beautiful peak of pleasure there's nothing in that moment but bliss and freedom from suffering and joy and grace. And, and, and definitely for some people immediately afterwards, there's guilt and shame and all kinds of other things, you know, if, if not happy, snuggly things instead. But for many people, they do it maybe have a letdown after that moment of pleasure, that peak of pleasure. But it's that peak that we want to focus on. It's, the, it's that, that brief few seconds of expanded bliss, expanded joy that is a glimpse of our true nature and i truly believe that's why we crave it and yearn for it so much we know inherently as human beings that we are not meant to just survive just get through life just get through the day nine to five we're not meant to mm, suffer the way we do so needlessly and so unconsciously and so that moment of bliss that we experience we recognize that as our true nature as our birthright it is entirely possible to live every moment of our lives in a state of expanded open joy and in fact i truly believe that that is our true purpose because in that moment of expanded bliss and joy there's ultimate connection there's union with the divine there's union body mind and spirit there's union with partner and when we bring that out into our everyday life there's a sense of union community and and wholeness with with all with other human beings with all of the people that we encounter and i'm not saying that i'm there i'm not enlightened not you know not not even even close and yet I can say very clearly and very um, honestly and authentically that wow through these practices of being able to not just glimpse that moment of enlightenment but but actually be able to hang out there and integrate that as a way of life as a state of consciousness my entire world life has transformed remarkably and not just my life but the lives of all of the people that I am so blessed and lucky to come into contact with so that was a very very long introduction that's about me and orgasm but I'm saying all this because our guest this evening this is it's so beautiful and so brilliant our guest this evening is going to talk about exactly 
this, talk exactly about how we can reprogram our brains on a physiological level through practicing conscious pleasure. And I just think that is so phenomenal. I'm just so excited to have another human being uh, sharing the same message that I share. So our guest this evening is Thomas Hargrove. I've known him for years on Facebook as Serious Healer, and I'm so uh, thrilled to finally have an opportunity to bring him on the show. So Serious Healer, healer uh, is a world hall of fame martial artist uh, artist uh, energy healer lecturer national grand trine tantra teacher so we get to hear more about what national grand trine tantra is and personal coach who is also an active member of the internationally known g style dance crew he has studied so he's a dancer mm -hmm. he has studied numerous closed door systems on energy healing sciences and sacred arts of various cultures he will be featured as one of the presenters in an upcoming documentary called blow the power of human consciousness and the science of breath thank you so much for being here with us this evening Sirius. thank you very much debbie uh for having me on the uh, show this evening wonderful uh, to, uh first off i like to say that um i like to first just acknowledge the uh, passing of Prince today, yes. who was a uh, healer in his own right, who actually was able to uh, do much for people's lives through uh, his music and sexuality. Yes, thank so. you. Thank you for that. Yes, let's all, you know, honor the passing of an icon. And I, yeah, I agree. Like, I love, I, I, well, I was a child of the 80s. So Prince was so instrumental and fundamental for so many of us in celebrating our sexuality. He was such an incredible role model of integrated sexuality and freedom of expression. So blessings to you, Prince, wherever you happen to be in the universe. And may you, uh, may, may your next incarnation be better than this one. Yes, yes, I agree with that. And um, the theme of his music and the things you just described just seem to be in alignment with the uh, show this evening. Very so, uh, we're, so we're going to talk about uh, sexuality and orgasms and um, talk about how to restructure our thinking. Um, first off, I want to share that uh, I am a uh, te head teacher in the uh, Grand Trine Tantra system, along with uh, Master Yao Morris, who was my uh, my mentor in that particular system, and the system of Tantra is geared towards advancing people to the highest and best version of their self, and this is also uh, known as an energy uh, management system. So we deal a lot with the uh, body. We deal a lot with um, increasing the bliss as well as uh, manifestations and um, many, many other uh, things as well. So I'd like to give a thank you also to uh, Master Yao Morris, along with uh, many of the other teachers that I've studied from, from various lineages. Beautiful. Um, first off, I'd like to talk about the, uh, I'd like to talk about the uh, brain for a minute. And what I'd like to do is divide the brain up into three sections. Uh, first off, let's talk about the, uh, the primal brain, which lies at the, uh, at the uh, stem which is known as the uh, reptilian brain or the paleocortex region of the brain. This part of the brain typically deals with fight, flight, reproduction, eating, functions. The uh, next brain that you have is the uh, deals with the uh, limbic brain, or some people may call it the mammalian brain or the mating brain. And in the uh, emotional brain, it deals with the uh, concepts of love, bonding, and it also actually provides a motivating force, the force or the urges to satisfy the uh, functions of the reptile brain. So, for example, if, uh, if you're hungry, it's what it's going to do is it, it will elevate hunger above the other three functions, mm -hmm. and it will give you an urge to want to eat. It'll send you that urge, you know, and if, if, it's, if it's emotionally um, related, for example, if people have addiction uh, disorders dealing with stress and they eat, they can be tied in together, mm -hmm. you know, because the, uh, because the brain is going to um, um, process it as a survival function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The uh, third layer of the brain I want to talk about is the uh, most recent brain. It's the one that corresponds with humans deals with the uh, neocortex region of the brain. 
also known as the uh, prefrontal uh, cortex. This de- allows us the ability to discern, to make choices, and to rationalize. And in some circles, it's actually also called the lying or deceptive brain as well, because it can actually it can actually uh, cause a person to take something that's not true and make it true by wording it, by twisting things or turning it the way that sees fit to appease the reptile brain at the root. Mm-hmm. So um, those are the uh, basic three brains that um, I deal with when working with uh, clients. Now, how does this work with the body? Uh, you spoke about the uh, Tibetan systems, and with the Tibetan systems, the energy line or the center channel lines up with the brain. So whatever the state of the brain is, the central channel is normally a representation of what that is, you know. So how the energy is coming off the chakras or the energy centers in the body can tell you a lot about a person's uh, health. So to the degree that the brain is balanced, it will dictate what's going on in the body because that also um, corresponds to the endocrine system or the uh, release of the hormones in the body as well. Yes, yes. So, the, so our understanding of the central channel is, is, or my understanding of the central channel is the core of the life force. So, so it's like a white straw that runs from the soft spot on the top of the skull through the center of the body in front of the spine, anterior to the spine, and ends at the perineum. And then the chakras are placed along the central channel. So I think of it like um, like the central channel is the main trunk of the tree, and the yes. chakras are like knots, and then all the channels and nadis radiate out from the chakras, and those become like the branches. Yes, exactly. Yes. And um, with, the, uh, heal- with, with the healing work, if you look at systems like acupuncture, they talk about 12 meridians. But actually, uh, all of them run through the central channel. So, and like in the uh, Tibetan channel, in the uh, Tibetan systems, a lot. If you're going to do uh, diagnosis, you just have to go along the central channel, and it'll tell you so much about what's going on with the organs. Oh, as absolutely. Well. Yes, because each of the chakras, well, so what I teach is five element, Tibetan five element tantra. So each of the chakras relates to a different, a different element, and each element relates to a different physiological functioning of the body or governs a different physiological functioning of the body. So, for example, like the air element, which sits, which we understand is sitting in the throat chakra, uh, oversees and governs the skin, the hair, all of the respiratory and gaseous functions of the body, including the respiration, the respiration of the cell, and then also the nervous system so each elemental um, chakra governs a functioning of the body and so we can also look at when we know what that functioning is we can look at the symptoms and then diagnose where there may be an imbalance for example chronic skin issues are a symptom of an air element imbalance correct correct now one of the other things the way um, everything links up also is that with the uh, the chakras along the uh, central channel they also um, correlate with um, the various uh, auras, uh, layers in the aura yes. as well. So, for example, when you say the um, the air element, that's also connected with what we call the etheric uh, template body. Mm-hmm. So if I'm working with a client and they start choking, they start having, um, they'll start, face starts turning red, you know, a lot of coughing, almost like they cannot breathe. A lot of times that's where trauma or certain memories are stored. So what I would want to do is check that area and clear it Yes. so that the, so that the air or the breath can flow through the body. And, and, and as a result, the energy can now pass up yes. over the top of the head, you know, past the tongue into, into the, uh, into the uh, head, in the crown as well. You know, it can, it can pulse back and forth through there. So um, often a lot of, uh, childhood memories or traumas that are found there need to be cleared in a session if a person consciously has not resolved those issues in that area. That's stemming coming from the heart. Beautiful. So then how have you found in your work, because you're, you're quite proficient, it sounds like, with working with people's energy bodies and energy systems and chakras and that sort of thing. So let's talk a moment about trauma, because it's my belief that, you know, we're all living in the world that we live in. We're all traumatized to one degree or another, right? So some people have more severe trauma. Some people have more superficial trauma. But, you know, one of, for me, in my opinion, one of our primary sexual traumas is the belief that sex is something dirty, shame 
shameful and sinful. That sets up this, like, this divide, this schism between our basic humanity and this idea of, you know, being unloved and, and, um, you know, ostracized or shamed or, you know, guilt, all that stuff. So in your experience in, in your work, what have you found in regards to trauma and how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive the world? It, does it cause a disconnect? Does it get in the way of us experiencing, you know, our true nature? Yes, it can. <laughs> yes, it does. Um, what happens, uh, as I was talking about the layers of the brain, there's a section of the uh, part of the brain called the uh, amygdala, which there are actually two and one lies in the left and right hemispheres of the uh, brain. I like to think of the amygdala as the uh, bouncer or the security person for uh, checking uh, fear, you know, things that deal with fear. So as um, external stimulus is received through the five senses, it goes to the amygdala, and the amygdala, amygdala basically scrutinizes everything. It's like risk management. So um, after it scrutinizes something, it will plant an emotional uh, or brain emotional imprint that's based in um, a brain pattern, or we call it like a brain dendrite pattern. It'll set up an uh, imprint. So you'll have a stimulus, and then you'll have, you'll have something that results from that. So what happens in the uh, reptile brain, the reptile brain actually processes more in opposites, pain and pleasure. So when you take something like a doctrine like religion that most times is based in, you know, right and wrong opposites, the reptile brain now caters to that because it doesn't want, um, it's going to treat, treat fear in a stronger capacity than it will pleasure. So yes. if someone tells you, sex is bad, sex is evil, it was created by Satan, and, and so on and so forth. The brain says, I want to avoid discomfort. So if this is going to cause me discomfort around my peers, then I want to avoid it. But what happens is, is that you get this thing where it's nature versus religion. So yes. even though these, uh, these words or this program that might be sent in there, the reptile brain on another end says, you know what, we have to survive. And we got built-in mechanisms for that. So it says, you know what? You want to suppress sex? Try it. So it communicates to the limbic system. The limbic system says, uh, basically, you know what? We're going to send some urges. So now a person begins to get horny. They start going through different issues, and then they, they develop conflict with them, which is, starts to deal with an imbalance that's going on in the brain, and it can start manifesting itself in the body, body be it through fibroids, prostate issues, um, people having all type of um, um, personality disorders, you know. And um, one concept that we deal with within the uh, Grand Trine is called the, what we call the counterfeit personality structure. And this is a result of trauma. So when the trauma comes in, what it does is it takes you away from what your natural and best self is, and it actually Look at it as um, bringing, like, almost like uh, distorting the, yes. the filter that you have on reality. Yes. So one counterfeit personality structure, for an example, might be someone that's psychopathic. This is somebody that has, uh, say, control issues. So they, their fear is of losing control. Now, in terms of intimacy, this person, if they allow you in and they make love to you or they become intimate with you, they feel like they have to control you often because they feel that you're going to potentially sabotage them. So their whole f filter becomes set up around that trauma. That makes total sense. And I love that idea, counterfeit personality structure. So basically it's like a defense mechanism. It's, it's the personality that we develop in response to being told that there's something wrong with us. Right. It could be from what you've been told. It could be things that you're bringing in from your environment because uh, you have the conscious uh, mind and you have the unconscious mind. Yeah. You know, the conscious mind is the least and least to know anything that's really going on with the body. You know, um, it. Um, I've seen a study where it said that it processes information through the five senses at 42 bits per second. The unconscious mind is taken in from some studies I've seen as much as 11 million um, or more bits of information per second. So it's, we're always surveying what's going on with us, even in our sleep, you know. And um, these things can uh, bring about all types of imprints and associations. 
So uh, what happens is is that if you were younger and um, someone told you were ugly or you felt ugly because something happened, then that initial imprint that goes in there, following that, anything that happens, your brain's going to rationalize it to line up with it. It's going to go in. So if somebody tells you, you know, you're beautiful, it'll go into the mind. The mind will say, we don't, that's not familiar to us, and it'll kick it out. Yeah, you know, I recently learned from from one of my mentors that um so so the way the brain is set up totally congruent with what you're saying, the way the brain is set up because it's set up for survival, right? So negative yeah. experiences create they imprint in the brain in a way that positive experiences simply don't because negative experiences mean danger, danger, danger. So we need to prevent those from happening again to ensure our safety and survival. Whereas pleasurable experiences they just they don't imprint as deeply. So in order to actually like uh, which makes them harder to access you know especially in moments of yes. conflict or pain you know or like you know sadness it's harder to access positivity so he said you're sharing with me that that in order to really dimply deeply imprint a positive experience you have to do it like as a whole body like as a visceral thing you have to like sit there and you have to savor it so like if someone says you know serious you're such a brilliant beautiful amazing man you know instead of just like wow well, okay thanks you have to actually like sit there and absorb <laughs> it and let it in yes. and like feel Feel it, taste it, smell it, so that it becomes a whole body experience. Which tips us into the category of talking about mindfulness. Yes. I'm, I'm sure you're very familiar with being present in the moment and experiencing it so we can allow those things to imprint us just as strong as fear would. Yes, as medicine. Let them imprint as medicine. Yes, yes. yes. So with the rational brain, you, by, by quieting the body or the fear and causing the amygdala to, to actually relax, let's say relax, causing the bouncer to relax now, it allows you in your state of calmness to be able to manipulate your reality within the chemical matrix. When I say chemical, I'm talking about the hormonal matrix that we live in. You know, because so often when we get triggered, we change states. We yes. might be calm one minute, we get in the car, we start driving, someone does something that we don't like, then we then uh, road rage kicks in because it's associated with something we're driving. And the more yes. that you drive, the more that you're going to go through this road rage possibly. Everybody on the road is doing something wrong. Whereas though you can have another person driving the same road and they're not complaining. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and it's all a and I love that that you mentioned it's it, it's it's just a chemical response. So so we get triggered and the brain releases chemicals. And so if the trigger is a positive trigger, then it releases positive chemicals. If it's a negative trigger, it releases you know adrenaline and cortisol and right. stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. So what happens is is that each cell is a living organism that you program by your thoughts oh, and your wow. emotions. So it gets stored in the body. So Coming off the central channel now, these uh, reactions are stored there. So you have the uh, body, you have the emotions, and then you have the uh, the thought that goes along with it. So it's almost like a psycho-emotional type thing that's going on in the body. So if I find an area, in the, if I'm moving my hand over the top of someone's body, and I find where the energy may be, say, scattered, which will be more of like an excessive fire type of element, what I can do is actually condense the energy down if that's where the trauma is and how it's expressing itself. So by changing maybe the position in the body and changing um, the um, element of the energy, the polarity of it, that can now go back and start working towards the mind by releasing that from the body. And then what I, what I would probably do is imprint it with something positive because you want to put something in that place. Yes. Yes, you want to replace it. Yeah, and I love that, you know, and it, it's like we, we as Westerners, we want to compartmentalize everything, right? And you want to say body, mind, spirit, like as if they're separate yeah. things, but you're so spot on. It's one organism. It's the body, mind, spirit. It's one thing. There's no separation. And so what you do to one, you do to all. Yes, yes, there's a oneness. So um, in the machine culture center <laughs> society, that we're in is very visually orientated, which, by the way, the eye is the fastest nerve and it could, and plugs directly into the reptile brain. So a lot of times we're very visual. Yes. So it's hard for people to even be present 
with someone else because the mind is all over the place. Mm-hmm. It needs visual stimulus. It's hard to sit and listen to a lecture. You know, it's almost like it has to be like a, a, a trained ability. You know, it has to be trained more so, I think, in this day and age within Western culture, especially. So what happens is, is if you're going by your eyes with a lot of things, that we, what the reptile brain would do, it wants to uh, separate things. Mm-hmm. It wants to put it into parts. So it can identify what may be dangerous and what might be friendly. So uh, this compartmentalizing thing typically, uh, you know, happens with us. And it, it's, it's hard for us to develop, develop the oneness. Now, if we're connected with our bodies and we're in more of a right brain state, we can, we can see things in more of a oneness type of, um, uh, from a oneness p- uh, point of view that everything is connected. Okay, you know, so- I can see my connection to you and I can experience my connection with you as well as what's going on with, within me. Beautiful. So this is exactly where we're going to dive into using pleasure to reprogram that. So we've clearly outlined, you know, that, that our, that our perception, our view gets all effed up because of our personal traumas and our cultural trauma, right? So that we develop this like warp perception and these different ways of coping. So now we want to find out how we can use pleasure as medicine to repattern and reprogram that mechanism. So, so Thomas, we're, we're talking about how, you know, pain and trauma, uh, distort our perception of reality, and so let's talk about how pleasure can heal and mm, what do we want to say? Heal our perception. I want to say reestablish our perception of reality as uh, one of positive, uh, loving, kindness, compassion, and benefit to others. Okay. Um, first off, I like to talk about uh, orgasm. Yes. And um, orgasm in the sense of... Um, Genital pleasure being uh, one of the ways of achieving orgasm. And uh, within the systems that I've studied, we have orgasm that can happen on an energetic level, and it, as well as it communicates through the body. But it's not specific to just the genitals. You evolve past that. So you can actually have orgasms from no touch. You can have 100, 200, 300, 400, 500. Orgasm. You can have three hours of orgasm if you want them, and they can occur at uh, one every eight tenths of a second. Mm-hmm. So, then, um, so let me pause you there because I wanted I, I, w- I want you to share a definition of what you're calling orgasm because for some people who are either accustomed to like you know genital sneezes or having really oh, intense. Okay. Or, or having really intense climaxes, like a really intense, like a gazoon type, gazoon type, or, you know, like sneezing at one eighth of a, every eighth of it, whatever. That's gonna be freaking overwhelming, right? So, so right. when you say orgasm, I'm guessing you're not meaning these like huge exhaustive explosions. You're meaning what? Well, what I'm what I'm saying is this: is that with the um, typical genital sneezes, as you talked about, it could be someone say masturbating. So a male may ejaculate fluid, but it doesn't mean he had an orgasm. Right. Okay. A woman can, uh, through clitoral stimulation, she can she can achieve a clitoral orgasm. But what I'm talking about that there's normally a rise and then there's a drop that happens with this. You know, and women's bodies recover a lot quicker than men generally. But what I'm talking about is that this, these type of orgasms are full-body orgasms, or they can occur in various places in the body. So they can occur in the mouth, the throat, the breast, the elbows, the knees, you know, you name it. You know, you can feel it even outside the body, in the aura, where it's actually pinging in the aura. You know what I mean? And what happens is, these don't occur as more like a peak and drop. It's more of a wave. Yes, exactly. And it could be a continuous wave, which most people don't know it exists because they've never been exposed to it. Or they, um, what should I say? Or they're shut down because they're more penis-centered or more clitoral-centered. And they're, you know, so when they're making love, for example, a woman may be with a man, and she's just maybe looking for oral pleasure first, 
Well, then she's using the guy to actually rub against him. Now, if she's fantasizing about some other things, then she's not even being present with the guy. So it's almost like he becomes almost like a, a, a scratching post for orgasms. Same thing with the male. A male that goes in and has these pre uh, these thoughts from porn or other things in his head or whatever he did with another mate, he's not being mindful or present with the woman in front of him. So what he's basically doing is masturbating inside of the woman. Yes. Yes, exactly. And so, okay, beautiful point there. So, so what we're calling orgasm in this conversation from this point forward isn't necessarily the gazoontite or the explosive. We're talking about these, these, uh, an expansion of energy in the nervous system or an expansion of energy in the energy body or in the energy channels. Like it's, it's, a, right. and it, it's, it can be perceived more as like a wave or a ripple as opposed to this peak in this decline. So just wanting to put that out there. And then also, you know, something most, many people are what wouldn't recognize that as an orgasm because we are conditioned to only view climaxes as orgasms. So I, in my work, I find that there's, there's lots of people who are having these subtle little, you know, f- flutters where they start out as subtle little flutters and not recognizing them as orgasm. But once they start embracing this as an actual orgasm, then they become much more than flutters. They become these like really profound, delicious, juicy experiences. Yes. And I would even say that the, or- the orgasm is always there, especially with women. It's yeah. always there. It's just tapping into it. Yes. Thank it's you. just tapping into it. So um, you just have to get on the right frequency with it. That's all. Yes. You know, and once you open the channel for that one time and you're conscious of it, then you can do it again and again Beautiful. and again. The key thing is not to make it an analytical process. Yes. <laughs> yes. Beautiful. You know, Beautiful. Open yourself up. So, um, what happens with the orgasm is that there are hormones released similar to what's going on with fear. Mm-hmm. So just like when you have the fear, um, you have like uh, what's called norepinephrine uh, or adrenaline that's released. That deals with stress. Guess what? That's released also through orgasm. Mm-hmm. So what I found is that you can use the same uh, stresses that you may find in orgasm and you can use those to manipulate the brain, which talk, which actually is reflective on what some call neuroplasticity, mm-hmm. which is basically the science on how the brain is affected by how you program it or how it can be manipulated. Mm-hmm. It becomes very malleable. So when you're actually in an orgasmic or in a blissful state for an extended time, and there's a term uh, used called expanded sexual response, ESR, which was first coined by Dr. Patricia Keller, and later on there was a study by uh, Dr. Uh, Sayin, S-A-Y-I-N, I I believe his last name is, and with this ESR, it talked about being extended states of bliss for one minute or more, and actually in this study they used uh, women for this, and it talked about altered states of consciousness. Mm-hmm. That can that can go on also with this. So capitalizing on this, what I found is when a person is going through um, a energetic um, session, that trauma can pull up, and they can start experiencing this trauma. Now they just like in meditation, it's important for the person to be able to resolve it when it comes up. Otherwise, if they fight and it close up, this thing will will stay on them like the boogeyman. Yeah. It'll come up and it'll sit in your face until you realize this is just an illusion or, or it has no power on me. You just need to be mindful and observe it and pass through it. But, what, yes. but when we're triggered, a lot of times we get caught up in the emotional thing that's going on and forget, oh, my God, this is my integrant system, you know, acting out <laughs> in this matrix. So mm-hmm. um, within these uh, sessions or when you have a lover, that can help even guide you through the experience when it comes up. If they can take that reptile brain, quote unquote, negative experience and speak a few words or know how to guide the energy, they can guide it into a way that it's going to be constructive. Because once the body's up under uh, intense pleasure, then the, the the brain dendrites become malleable. They become warm. It becomes like heating up metal. And then oh, okay, you can wait, manipulate wait, wait. 
I want to pause. Yeah. So, so you're saying that when the when the body is experiencing extreme pleasure, then the brain is more malleable. Yes, you can you can Whoa. manipulate it. Wow, I love that. Now, in a lesser state of pleasure, like say someone's stroking your arm and you're really not present, and you say, "Okay, that feels good," but you're really not paying any attention. There's really not much power in that. Right. But when you take a person's mind and connect it directly into the body. The same way as if you were fearful that a bear is standing over you, <laughs> looking like, and you fear that this bear is going to kill you. The same presence that you would have with that bear, take that presence to the bedroom. Yes. Take that presence to the uh, table. But this time, we're not going to deal with fear. you got to be willing to experience pleasure for no reason at all, is what I tell my people. For no reason at all. You don't need a reason to feel good. Mm-hmm. And once you can get past that, then we can start working. Mm-hmm. If you just set that in your mind, you plant that thought, then we'll build on it. Beautiful. So, so uh, for example, through uh, the body work that we do, that's what I do. In the, that's, that's what goes on in the session. We'll go in, find the areas, that the organs where the energy may be off. We'll tap into that. And then based on the intentions that were set forth before, and coaching them first, this will this will give permission for these dendrites to start changing in a very powerful way. And then once the orgasm orgasmic waves are occurring, they can always take that off the table. They just need a maintenance program that's going to follow up with the same thought pattern. So when you change the thought, you you change the reality. Yes, exactly. So we change the thought, we change the reality. So we use pleasure yeah. to make the brain more malleable. And then part of part of my understanding experience of pleasure is well, it, you know, there's two experiences that get us get us totally present in the body: extreme pleasure and extreme pain. Yeah. And so when we're focused on this pleasure and these traumas or these you know pains arise, these issues arise, it makes it easier to stay focused on the pleasure because it feels so good, right? It's we're there. And- so it makes it's the passing right. of trauma easier. It's like, you know, it's like pooping, right? It just kind of poops out and, and there you go. Right. So, like, when I'm working with a client or with students, I say, uh, we don't do trauma here. <laughs> we do restoration. We don't, we yes. don't do trauma. Nobody's even focusing on that. Yes. Because the more that you focus on it, the brain will, sit, will program itself to accept that. So if you're always worried, then you're telling your brain, I like to be worried all the time. Yes. Your body's going to respond to it and say, okay, this is what you're feeding us, so this is what you like, so it wants to maintain that balance. So you will find that you will find anything to worry about almost. You know, you get certain people, it just seems like you cannot pull them out of a hole. Every time you talk to them, they're going through something, and they don't have to do that. You know? Right. So first we have to get over to, you know, allow ourselves to feel good for no reason at all. Get that in your mind first, and then you can start writing. You may have had a tra- traumatic life before that, but then if you treat like a movie and you say, that was the beginning of my movie, but I'm going to write the ending to where it's going. this is going to be a, tra- uh, a tremendous, victorious story from this point forward. So what happened in the past is not going to dictate who I am now. It doesn't dictate who I am now. I'm going to embrace a different reality and write a different, the rest of my movie is going to be different. Yes. Yes, yeah, so a few That's points the there. Few few points there. So what you focus on grows. Exactly. So beautifully stated, what you focus on grows. So if we focus focus on pain and suffering and whatever, then that's you know that's that's what we get because we're focused on it. But the other thing I love that you pointed out is that um, shit, and I totally just lost it. <laughs> it was so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> It was a really beautiful point that you had made, and it totally just slipped my brain, my my brain processing. So I'll let you go on. <laughs> okay, well, there's a, there's a there's a dual side to that. So once you have the pleasure, and you're creating the change, the maintenance program is important. Yes. So Thank you. it requires the maintenance. That's going to allow you to um, basically shut the e- the ego, which the fear in the left brain is like very associated is associated with. Not saying the ego is bad, but you need to. Give it some type of logic to shut it up. <laughs> to shut the Beautiful. brain up. 
<laughs> yes. Yeah. And so that's that brought back to me what I was going to say, which I thought you you so. I'm right here with you, Debbie. I, that's why I said it. So you, I figured Thank that's where you were going. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. That, this whole point you've, of you saying that you don't need a reason to feel good. So that is so crucial because we are so conditioned in this culture. And again, this is a subconscious conditioning that pleasure is wrong or bad and that we need it has to be a special occasion to feel pleasure of any sort not just sexual pleasure but any kind of sensual pleasure and that we're allowed to experience only so much but not more without feelings of guilt without feelings of shame that sort of thing and just this idea that we could actually exist like we could actually just be happy for no reason, not because anything great happened, but just and not just... sabotage it. <laughs> yes, yes. But yes. but the counter personality wants to sabotage it because there's always that voice that's creeping out in the mind that's saying that questions everything is scrutinized. <laughs> no one knows really what the origin of it is, but it slips in your head and says, you know, it'll 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 tell you the opposite of it. So basically, you know. Um, what I look at that as is, okay, you know what? We're going to be in the prison cell together, okay? So we're going to do life together. But my job is to suppress. I can't kill you, but I'm going to smack you around. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, you're not allowed to do anything without my permission. <laughs> so you look to gain it. You look, you look to uh, bring it to a point of submission to where it's not manipulating your life in a way that prevents you from evolving into becoming a human being. Thank you. And, and what I find I have to say is that the more I do the mindfulness practices and the more time we spend in these states of pleasure consciousness, the less uh, teeth that voice has, the less impact that voice has. Not to say that yes. it goes away completely or that, you know, maybe that's enlightenment when it goes away completely, but absolutely certainly. So things that used to, you know, before in the past, I'd be second guessing or criticizing myself. Like now they, if it may just be the slightest fluctuation that it comes up and it's so easy to choose away from that and for the pleasure because the pleasure consciousness has become the norm and the pain consciousness has become uh, the abnormal. Right. And let me tell you how I uh, work this thing. Now, we talked about the three layers of the brain. So the reptile brain wants to run the pleasure. So I'm catering to the pleasurable side. By the way, my classes or the way a healing session is set up. So we cater to the pleasurable side for the reptile brain. It'll run to that. Then the pleasure also is going to satisfy the emotional brain, which is programming. So the limbic system is like, thank you. Okay, we like that. Then the rational brain is saying, I'm not going to block this. We, lo we love this. So you're looking to satisfy the brain on three different levels, which are backed by all of the um, hormones that will cause you to uh, create life changes. I mean, I've been with people for, uh, I've hugged people, you know, for 30 seconds, and it's changed their life. Mm. I've seen it constantly with people I'm around. Shake a hand, person has an orgasm, or multiple orgasms. Put your arm around a person's shoulder. They have multiple orgasms. They don't know that they're capable of doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and it's not just about the orgasm itself, but it's more about the the, the releasing, the yes. restoration. Yes. And then even you'll find out that you can actually go through a second puberty. You, you get your you get your brain balanced. The body will line up with the brain. Beautiful. So now with these hormones going, your breast can grow, your penis can grow. You know, you can take on this glow. You know, when you, go, you might have been traumatized when you were younger that stunted that. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. I love that. And so such a perfect example of exactly why it, when you're doing your own practice and you're creating this energy, this power, this energy, this chiefful, this powerful force, and then you're around other people, they will naturally, their energy systems and their bodies will naturally reflex to that and respond to that and throw off everything that isn't in alignment with that. So what yes. a beautiful example of that. Yes. And I love the pleasure loop that you described for all three brains, the feeding the reptilian brain and the mammalian brain and the and the human brain the frontal cortex and creating this really positive uh ascending feedback loop this positive feedback loop which, which makes it easier and easier and easier to stay present relaxed and focused in these extreme states of bliss consciousness and so that's what we want to create on this planet imagine 
if you know if more people on this planet were living in a state of positive bliss consciousness pleasure consciousness it would be such a different planet yes and i'll even say this like one of the hormones such as oxytocin, which you, which you find in bonding through, say, like when the mother's breastfeeding with the infant, or you can find it, you know, you can, you can have that with a mate. Now, if you're in a session and you want to uh, move away from something, while you're having this within your body that's going on, say, in a session, what, what I look to do is to direct it so that you're going to bond to what you want. So now we want to reinforce that with oxytocin. Mm-hmm. We want to reinforce that, like I said, with dopamine. We want to send the adrenaline there, as well as you know a bunch of the other uh, neuropeptides or neurotransmitters to that area, so that we can just blow blow the roof off the, off of whatever the old paradigm was. Yes. Now, yes. in the private and in, in, in the single practices, say such as doing meditation or doing um, performing something like the male deer exercise or the female their exercise. This allows you to work with yourself to develop a connection again with your body and with what you want. So you don't have to have a partner. You can do this by yourself as well. Yes, but exactly. While, if you can have both, then you take both. If a person doesn't have a partner or somebody that knows how to do this particular type of uh, body work, you know, in coaching, then you know what? Work yourself. And, um, what I found in um, some of the, uh, well, in one of the uh, Tibetan practices that I'm a part of is that, you know, um, often we talk about cooling the energy, uh, rising up from the spine, going upward, you know, to the top of the head, you know, which is the fire side of the body, and then it drips down the water side, you know. And other, in some other systems, if you focus on the water side of the body, you'll find that, this cool menthol energy, and this is what I work with, more, more so than the cool any energy. There's a cool menthol-like energy that comes across, and it's not overbearing like having too much fire energy in the body. So to the degree that your mind is ready, it's to the degree that your body will allow you to experience this uh, energy. And it comes out of nowhere. Mm. From out of the, the relaxation is where the explosions come from. Mm-hmm. And when a person is um, making love or when they're in a session, what happens is you talked about through orgasm, per people attain enlightenment. Well, through this course of uh, when the orgasms are extended into a wave, a person can go through a what they, what's called a mini death or little death. The body will start to stiffen up. The fingers will straighten out other than people saying the toes are curled, fingers are curled. The person's flesh will know they're fighting. When the fingers relax and extend and the toes relax, the body will take on an undulation that is mm-hmm. maybe like snake-like to some degree or another, and then the body will just pause. Yes. Beautiful. And the person will breathe through the skin in the body. Beautiful, beautiful. Then the breath will stop. And it's in that state that this enlightenment or these things that come on, these um, ES, you know, ESP or different things to click on, you can see colors, you know, outside of the body, different things when you get up, you know, opening the divine eye within yes. the head, which that's another conversation, but... You know, you open uh, up some of your other energy centers to expand your consciousness and not in a fearful way. That is so beautiful and so phenomenal. And I love that you share that so that we can all uh, look towards experiencing more of our sexual potential. We are we've got like one minute left. So serious healer, can you tell people how to get in contact with you to learn more? OK, uh, you can go to my website, www. Sirius, S-I-R-I-U-S, Elevation.com. You can reach me at contact at Sirius, uh, Elevation.com. I'm on Facebook under Sirius Healer, or it will say Thomas Hargrove. Also, I have a page called Sirius Jet, I-G, Sirius Jet. <laughs> and also, you can find me uh, within the uh, International Grand Trine group page on Facebook. And we say, and when we say serious, we mean spelled like the planet, S I R I U S. Yes, 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 yes not, like star. Yes, not serious, yes. like important and and like stern. Yes, yes. <laughs> though you are important, <laughs> <laughs> you're very important. <laughs> yes, yeah, I won't. I won't say how I came up with that name. It was. It, it was. Uh, I guess it was fate that allowed it because it was actually I was playing a joke and. 
Facebook won't let me change the name back, so I ended up in serious. <laughs> Well, we are we are out of time. So thank you so much, Sirius, for joining us this evening. Again, if you want to check him out, you can check him out at SiriusElevation.com. And, of course, you can always stay in contact we- with me at one of my many numerous websites, DaveyWordTantra.com, TibetanTantra.com, and AuthenticTantra.com, as well as checking me out on Facebook and Twitter at DaveyWordTantra. And be sure to subscribe to this show in iTunes and tune in so you don't miss a juicy drop of uh, anything that we put out. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that you have been touched, moved, inspired, awakened, and enlightened. And may you have many, many blissful orgasms and glimpse enlightenment over and over and over again uh, this and every day. Have a beautiful night. Blessings.